morning. So it's going to be uh, Stefan Tillman from the University of Sydney, who is going to speak about canonical cell decomposition for punctured real projective surfaces. So uh, Tillman, Stefan, the floor is yours. You're, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Patrice. And thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to speak here, and especially to Chen Chi, who seems to be doing a, a lot of the legwork for this conference. Um, so let me share my um, screen. Okay, I hope everyone can see this. So I want to talk about, yeah, as Patrice said, canonical cell decompositions for punctured real projective surfaces. Um, so roughly pictures like these ones here, um, where one can then also nicely sort of understand or study um, deformations of geometric structures on surfaces once one has them in these canonical cell decompositions. So what I'll talk about is mostly joint work with Robert, Har Robert Haraway, Robert Löwe, and Dominic Tate. Um, there's a paper on the archive that contains this material, but uh, stay tuned for an updated version. Okay, so, so let me begin. Beginning with a clean slide here, as you see. This, um, so let's start with a surface of genus G uh, with N vertices, you can think of it. So a triangulated closed oriented. And it's an important bit. I don't even say orientable. I really want to be oriented surface of genus G. Um, and so N, so with N vertices in the triangulation. So now what I want to do is I want to decorate the triangles and the edges with positive real numbers. So decorate each edge with two positive reals and each triangle with one positive real, okay? So we get kind of a picture like this here over our triangles. And let me even sort of put some nice coordinates on this. So let's call this 0, 1, 2. So I get a number here, maybe I call it A01. I go to see a A10. I call this here one A12. You see the pattern emerging. So A20 and A02. Yeah, so these are my numbers that are associated to the edges. And really, if you wish, you can think of them as sort of numbers associated to oriented edges. Yeah, so maybe one for the orientation in this way is this one here, and one for the orientation the other way is this one here. Okay, and then I have a number associated to a triangle. And now the question is, well, what, how, how do you interpret these numbers now geometrically, right? And we've uh, seen many ways of doing this. So the thing that I want to talk about are basically, I want to think of them as Fock and Gontrarov's A coordinates. So this is how I want to, um, Think of them. So I want to sort of have a realization of this uh, in R3 as follows. Realize. In R3 as follows. So what I want to do is I want to uh, think of the vertices really as vectors in R3. Let me draw it like this here. And uh, so they, of course, span a triangle. Yeah. And so here have my uh, vectors. Let's call them C1, C2, and here C0. Okay, so they span the triangle. So here my CI, I and R3. Okay. And 
The other thing that I will choose is I will choose curve vectors. So I will choose curve vectors Ri in the dual space. Okay. And um, they, they're supposed to satisfy the property that Ri applied to Ci is zero. So really what I get is a plane here that contains uh, this vector. So this here is the kernel of um, R1, say, yeah. And the other, so I have some kind of positivity condition and that is that Ri times Cj is bigger than zero if I is not equal to J, yeah? So there's a notion of these sitting on the um, positive side of this. Okay, so I can of course go to, I mean, if I want to look at this projectively, so if I go from R3 to RP2, yeah? So what do I see in RP2? I see my blue triangle. And then these lines, uh, the, these planes, they give me lines and I see sort of an inscribed triangle and a circumscribed triangle, yeah? Where basically the triangle is sort of on the positive side, yeah? Of each of these, um, each of these hyperplanes. Okay, so this, uh, but how, how do I get my numbers? So my numbers that I want is, so my A, before here, I had this kind of decoration of the triangle by these numbers. And so what I want is that A, I, J is exactly uh, the uh, curve vector R I evaluated at uh, the vector C J. Yeah? So, so these are these positive numbers uh, that I had here. And then the uh, T012 is just a determinant of the matrix that I get when I put the three vectors as columns into this matrix. Okay, so this makes use of the fact that I said my surface is oriented. So there's some kind of preferred orientation here that tells you in which way I can take these things here so that really also the sign of the determinant is well defined. Yeah, so that comes from the um, orientation of my surface. Good, um, so I think of this here as a decorator triangle. I call this here decorator. And this here, uh, over here in R3 is the associated concrete triangle. But really uh, the concrete triangle is really an order triple of uh, vectors and covectors. Yeah, so it's this vector and covector decoration um, that, I, that I have here. Okay, and so now it's a nice little exercise in uh, linear algebra. So this is uh, what you can do now in your spare time whilst I keep up. Oh, there's a question, yeah? Yeah, just if I could quickly, the order or the logic here, these uh, vectors CI and RI, they come first and they determine the weights rather than the weights determining those vectors? Yes, yeah, so it goes both ways, yeah. And this yeah, is just, I was, I was, I was, one way was obvious, I just wasn't sure about the count the other way. Yeah, exactly. That's that's now my my little fact that I'm about to uh, say. Okay, sorry. And we'll, yeah. we'll give you as an exercise to, to solve. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. But it's uh, in that sense. I mean, you're right. I mean, you you could say let's let's start with the uh, decoration and then get the numbers from this because this, of course, seems here the seems like the obvious uh, way of going right from here to there to the decorated triangle. And so the nice fact here is that um, given any, any decorated triangle, triangle, uh, the, the concrete triangle, there exists such a concrete triangle, an associated concrete triangle, and it is unique up to the action of SL3R. Okay, so, so this is really the 
the key here that these triangles that we have here now in these nice triangles that we have here in R3, you can move them around by SL3R, but this is all you can do, okay? So, so this, is, um, this is a very nice way of uh, setting things up here. Okay, and so the picture really, I mean, the um, this you might seem like an abstract picture what I draw here in RP2, but this is actually sort of a very useful thing to have in, uh, have in mind in terms of thinking about it. So here the projective classes of C0, C1, C2, and then here I have the um, kernels of my uh, curve vectors, again, projectivized. Yeah? Okay, so here's then a second fact, because we do this now for our whole triangulation, right? We have the surface, uh, we have a surface of genus G, we've decorated uh, the triangle. So the question is now, how does this sort of propagate as I go from yeah, one triangle in my surface to the next triangle, and I want to keep going and embedding these triangles yeah, in, um, in R3. Okay, so, so here's then fact two. So if I give you two triangles that share an edge, so here are my two triangles, and say this here was zero, one, two, and maybe here's three, yeah? And you've already sort of taken this triangle and you've realized that here somewhere in um, R3 in such a way. Now then the weights, and this of course uh, kind of makes sense, right? There's, where, where does this sort of last vertex end up? And these weights here, and there's of course here three coordinates, uh, namely these sort of two edge weights here, these ones, this one, this one, and also the triangle weight, of course, it's three coordinates and I'm looking for vectors in R3. So it kind of makes sense to think there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. And that's in fact true. I mean, these three weights here, they uniquely determine the position of the last vector yeah, that I have. So once I've sort of fixed everything here, once I have this concrete triangle, then the position of this vertex is uniquely determined by these ones here. And moreover, I mean, the positivity condition has a really nice um, uh, consequence here. So let me uh, draw this here. So here I have my uh, red triangle that I started with. And here it's sort of um, maybe here the dual vectors. And all the positivity conditions, they imply that this last vertex the last vertex that I have here, this one here, actually ends up somewhere in this triangle here. Yeah, so it ends up somewhere here, and this is how my next triangle looks. Okay, and so as you as you see, when you keep sort of developing this picture here, this image, and this will have some kind of uh, line here. Maybe you develop a next triangle. You get sort of a vertex here, and you get whoops, a curve vector here. And you get another vertex maybe here and a curve vector here, and you see what's happening, right? And that actually, when you, when you keep doing this, you really get a map now from the universal cover of your surface into R3 or into RP2, yeah? With the property that actually the image of the um, this kind of developing map will be a nice sort of convex set in the end. Okay, so... Um, so let me maybe just write on some words. So I, I, it's very hard always to, to um, speak and write at the same time. But anyway, I'll um, try my best. So, um, so this is fact two. Um, so let, let me just sort of write down fact two in a more satisfactory way. So A20, A03, and T023 bigger than zero. Uh, imply that C3 is uniquely determined. Uh, and, and realized as shown. Yeah, so, so this here is my C3. Okay. Um, so it's the, so extending equivariantly. Uh, this gives us a map. So here's my universal cover of the surface. Here's, of course, my surface. I take the uh, triangulation that I had here and really think of this as um, 
the punctured surface, yeah? So, so this is really the universal cover of the punctured surface, yeah? <clears throat> and um, so this now gives me a map here into um, uh, R3, yeah, with image a piece with linear hypersurface. Uh, and when I sort of map this down to RP2, uh, here I get image um, a convex open domain. Okay, so this is, uh, so let me draw schematically. So here's the universal cover of my surface. And some are all universal you know, covers of surfaces look the same. Um, so here I am, and so I map this over, and then here I get this kind of um, hypersurface that's kind of triangulated. These triangulations are not so easy to draw because they also actually become quite so sort of spiky. Um, very quickly, but anyway, this is roughly my picture in R3. But then when I move down into projective uh, space, it um, let me even start sort of drawing this convex domain that I get in the end. Yeah, the pictures actually look uh, a lot more manageable. Okay, so, so this is what I have here. Yeah. Um, good. So, so this is this picture, but then the other thing is, so we talked before about the action of SL3R. So in fact, any two triangles with the same coordinates, with the same invariance, are related by an element and by a unique element in SL3R. So what I get is I have this action here. Here, uh, the fundamental group of uh, S acts by deck transformations. And uh, here I get an induced action by SL3R. Yeah? And so in particular, I get sort of a homomorphism. I get uh, a discrete and faithful homomorphism into SL3R from this. So get rho from pi one of S into SL3R. That's a faithful and discrete. And the nice thing is you can actually write down the uh, matrices for this homomorphism, again, just using uh, these kind of invariants here. So, so there's a way of working out. So there's a really nice observation by Fock and Gontrov. There's a way of working out when you sort of go from one triangle to the next. If you, if you think of a deck transformation that sort of goes through a bunch of triangles, you can actually write it as a product of sort of local matrices where you really just sort of think of what do I need to do in order to go from one edge to the, yeah, cross, cross an edge, take one triangle to the next triangle. And then there's also some kind of correction move that just says, well, actually I need to sort of reorient myself maybe in this triangle, yeah, in order to go across the, the right edge. And so these are these so-called uh, positive uh, representations because what you will, what one sees is when one writes on these matrices, the entries uh, are rational functions in these kind of coordinates here. Um, and these rational functions are, well, so, so you see these polynomials and they ne never have negative signs in them, only positive signs. Yeah? So, so this, this kind of um, notion of a positive triangulation, yeah? a positive representation. Okay, um, so, so what we have, so I have a map and we've done something really, really elementary here, but now we have a map from up again zero uh, to the two E plus T, yeah, where E is the number of edges and T is the number of uh, triangles. And this now goes into, uh, so let me just give this some fancy notation. So T3 S, uh, Gn 
Yeah. So, um, so this is supposed to be the um, basically a Teichmüller space of real projective structures. Yeah, Teichmüller space or moduli space of real projective structures, but. In this case, I actually have these decorations. I have two decorations for each uh, cusp. I have uh, one vector and one co-vector decoration. And so this is sort of indicated by the symbol here. So these are doubly decorated. So these are doubly decorated. Yeah, um, real projective structures. of finite volume. Okay. Yeah. And um, from here, of course, I can sort of map to the undecorated structures. So let's say T3 GN. And uh, inside this here, of course, is the usual uh, Teichmüller space of hyperbolic structures on SGN. Okay, and um, so we have sort of just described a map that goes from here to there. And then in fact, uh, it's not so hard to show that this is in fact um, a, um, a homeomorphism, yeah. And um, so of course you sort of need to put the right, I mean, when I say homeomorphism, right, I mean, first you could show it's a one-to-one -one map, but then also you can sort of put the compact open topology on this here where you sort of developing maps uh, to define the uh, topology. And so then you can show it's a homeomorphism. Okay, so, so it's sort of a nice, nice fact. So, okay, so this is a beautiful uh, parameterization that we have here. And um, of course, people who, who are familiar with, say, um, Penner's uh, decorated Teichmüller space, so Penner's. Teichmüller space. It sits inside there because, of course, the um, if I have a hyperbolic structure, uh, then this is in particular a real projective structure, and uh, the way to get those is um, the embedding. I mean, one embedding is given by just choosing all coordinates along the edges always to be the same. So here, this is, so if you have a coordinate here, you put the same coordinate here, yeah? Because in, in my setting, there could be distinct ones. So let's call them A, A, maybe here, B, B, and here you have C, C, okay? And then also there's a particular choice for the triangle coordinates. And so you just take the square root of two A, B, C, okay? So this is your triangle coordinate. So this is, a way of embedding now Penner's uh, decorated Teichmüller space into this uh, doubly decorated Teichmüller space. So uh, can be viewed as the subspace uh, general, yeah, um, defined by these decorations. Okay. Are there any questions up to this point? Yeah. Okay, so then um, now we'll carry on. So I want to talk about uh, canonical triangulations. So for hyperbolic surfaces, Epstein and Penner, they have a celebrated canonical cell decomposition. Um, for finite volume hyperbolic uh, manifolds uh, that are non-compact. And so this was generalized by Cooper and Long to real projective manifolds of uh, finite volume. So, so Cooper and Long generalized the Epstein Penner. canonical cell decomposition 
um, to the setting. And in the case of surfaces, we can really solve this algorithmically uh, using, using these coordinates. So can, can compute uh, using A coordinates. Using a very simple edge flipping algorithm. So using simple edge flipping. So, so what's the idea? So, so the idea of the cell uh, the uh, canonical um, cell decomposition is, so I said we get this image in R three of this sort of PL, oops, of this PL surface. Um, but this PL surface sort of might um, locally, yeah, towards maybe here's my origin, right? It might sort of have regions where uh, it sort of curves down, yeah, rather than regions where it always sort of um, goes up. Yeah, so there's really some kind of convexity uh, issue here. And what we want is we're really aiming for a um, hypersurface here. That has a property that it's always basically um, convex, yeah. Apart from the fact that we have these sort of flat bits here. But so, um, and you can see that really, what you want to do is, I mean, when you see um, when you see sort of two triangles, or if you see an edge along which you um, are curved or bent in the wrong direction, what you really want to do is you just want to flip it. Yeah, so if I look at it from, uh, look at the picture from below. So here in my domain, what I see is projectively, of course here, I just see this edge in these two triangles. This looks fine, right? And so here you can of course apply an edge flip To do this here, yeah, okay. And what does edge flip does up in the uh, triangulation up here? It replaces. So you had my vertices, and the vertices are fixed, and it just replaces the true two triangles I had before, namely this one and this one, by these two triangles here. Okay, and so I'm flipped in the right way. And what you see here is, I mean, it's uh, really, again, quite elementary. I and mean, we um, can think of this as a determinant condition, right? And the faces, the different faces that you see, of course, you can compute volumes uh, that you see here spanned by these objects. And you see here that the uh, volume in this case is bigger uh, than the volume that you get uh, so the volume on the left hand side is bigger than the volume that you see on the right hand side. Yeah. And this observation you can really make into an, um, into an intrinsic fact using the, um, using the coordinates. So intrinsically. And so what I want to call this here is the notion we want to define is what's called an altitude. And so here the altitude of this edge, let's call it the edge E. Uh, so here, the altitude of this edge E, yeah, is uh, negative. Okay, so this is what uh, we don't like, and the altitude of this edge here is positive. Yeah, and so so this is basically yeah. There's a question again. Yeah, if I could just for clarity, so you had pointed out the curvature in the left-hand picture, quote, being the wrong way, and you were pointing to an edge, so you're referring to the mean curvature. I guess I was focused on the vertex and seeing the vertex as having negative Gauss curvature. Is that another way to look at this? Oh, so the, um, the problem with the vertices is these, um, 
vertices here, I mean, they, um, this is sort of a locally infinite picture, right? Um, so there's not, I don't have finitely many triangles around this vertex. When yeah, I guess I'm, I was looking at the, I was looking at the picture above. So the, the realization. Yeah. Yeah. So this, yeah. So, so I was sort of viewing that as the problematic vertex in terms mm -hmm. of cur Gauss curvature. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it, I mean, because you want to say it kind of looks that saddle shaped, right? In this setting. Yeah. 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 So, so it's basically um, a saddle. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically a saddle. But the, the um, issue along here is that, um, yeah, I mean, maybe one can do this. I mean, the, the thing is that it's of course um, sort of the the this kind of saddle point, right? Um, it's kind of a um, it it's a boundary point, right? I mean, all my vertices lie on the boundary, so I don't um, I can't really sort of go a full circle around this vertex. But what I could try to do is, yeah, I mean, I can sort of try to identify a region where I sort of go down and up again. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Um, so I, I haven't tried to work this out in, in terms okay, of these cool. coordinates. Yeah, because I just, I, I think that there's a connection between seeing this, the variation of the edge curvature you're noting yeah. and the, the, the signature of a saddle. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, look into this. That's actually, that's, that's nice, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, um, so if you want to compute the altitude or at, at an edge, so here's maybe my edge that I'm interested in, E minus E plus, maybe I call this here A minus A plus, call this here B plus, call this here C plus. And you only need D minus, maybe the triangle coordinate here is A, the triangle coordinate here is B. So my little uh, mnemonic to remember how to compute this is I do this, and then here I do this. So that's the only way I can remember how to do this. So then the altitude at my edge E is, so I have A times, and then I take uh, these kind of products here. So then I have A times, uh, E plus C, whoops, E plus C plus, uh, plus E minus D minus, and then minus E plus E minus, and then plus B times, and now it's just the analogous thing. So it's E plus B plus, plus E minus A minus, minus E plus E minus. Okay, so you get this really nice uh, equation. It's uh, of degree three. And that really tells you, yeah, if you just compute the altitude at some edge, if it's negative, um, you flip. If it's zero, you may just leave it in. I mean, altitude zero just means that you, everything is in a plane, yeah? So this is out E equal to zero. Uh, everything just lies in a plane. So you leave it alone for the moment and then, um, if it's uh, positive, you leave it alone. And now you just go through the edges one by one, check whether the altitude is uh, ne negative. If it's negative, you flip, uh, and otherwise you don't do anything. And then the um, basic uh, fact is that this algorithm terminates, right? And that's always what, what we're worried about. Yeah, there's infinitely many uh, triangulations uh, up to isotopy usually. And um, so, so why does this algorithm terminate? So the algorithm is if out e less than zero flip um, and do this until all edges are uh, positive and so terminates. Uh, basically because Cooper and Long say so. So what do they show? What do they show in order to um, show that this um, this uh, decomposition works? Well, it's actually the same result that basically um, Epstein Penner need uh, in, in their proof of the cell decomposition theorem. And that is really just that you don't have accumulation of vertices down at zero. Yeah, so basically any level you chop up 
So below any level, yeah, there's only finitely many vertices. Yeah, and so so this basically this this ensures that uh, your algorithm will really terminate and then give you this nice uh, nice uh, hypersurface that you were interested in. And this is then the the canonical cell decomposition that you can associate to a point. Okay. So so for each uh, ideal cell decomposition. Uh, say delta of S G N get a partition set because I'm done with this here. So um, let's call this here C circle delta, which is now all points in your um, uh, doubly decorated uh, Teichmuller space of your surface such that the um, canonical cell decomposition that you get associated to this point is really the uh, cell decomposition that I've given you. Yeah, so this is the... Okay. And um, yeah, so this gives us now a nice partition of our space. into these sets. So this is a disjoint union where you go over all cell decompositions and you do this. Okay, and so the claim is that each of these partition sets here that I'm looking at is a cell. Yeah, so this would give us a nice uh, cell decomposition um, for this moduli space. So claim is the this thing here is homeomorphic to R to the 2e plus t minus k. So I need to explain what k is. So what k is the number of edges uh, needed to refine uh, delta, my ideal cell decomposition, to an ideal triangulation. Okay, and so then the corollary would be uh, that this is the cell decomposition and um, it's also naturally invariant under the mapping class group. Yeah. Um, so the um, this kind of invariance comes from the fact that, I mean, if I look at a mapping class, I can really think of a mapping class as um, sort of relating one cell decomposition or ideal triangulation to another. And again, any two of them are related by, uh, by edge flips. Okay. And also, I mean, these edge flips, I mean, if you do edge flips, you can basically also work out the new coordinates. So, um, I didn't. I didn't give you the formula for this, but you can actually work this out quite nicely, um, knowing how to go from uh, vector and co-vector decorations to uh, coordinates. Yeah. Okay. So maybe um, I still have quite some time, so I would like to um, at least sketch the proof. Yeah. So, so how do we show that this is a cell decomposition? So here's sort of case one. So let's say delta is a triangulation. Um, so what I will do is I write um, my elements actually. So let's say a bar, a bar, yeah, is an element of r to the t times r to the 2e. This is kind of my notation that I really use these kind of uppercase letters a i here and then these lowercase letters here and here I have sort of maybe yeah, uh, a j plus 
aj minus and so forth. Yeah, so these are my um, coordinates here. And so a nice sort of first observation is, I mean, when you look at this uh, altitude condition that you have here, this one here, yeah, um, what you notice, well, you notice that if you make all of these coordinates here equal to one, yeah, uh, then of course you've you've won. I mean, this this is always going to be positive regardless of what a and b are, yeah, uh, because then you see a one here and a one here, uh, and in fact it's sort of true for yeah a bigger a bigger domain as well of values. Okay, so that's sort of the first um, observation here is that so if you um, so for each choice of triangle coordinates. Um, you have that making all the edge invariants one, you get straight away an element in here. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in fact, uh, you can be a bit more a greedy. Uh, so if you take a ball of radius one, say around one, it's also contained in here. Okay. And uh, what's the second second observation? So we want to sort of show that things are cells. So in these kind of level sets, so you have these uh, nice level sets here. And um, so if you have some element in this supposed cell, then actually the whole segment from here to this kind of more canonical guy, this one here, is contained in this set. So, so then the segment, the line segment, the line segment, oops, uh, between. A, a bar and a bar one is in the set. So our sets, I mean, sadly, they're not completely star shaped, but at least they're sort of star shaped in uh, level sets. Yeah. So so here maybe this this is kind of what these things look like. Yeah. So so we have this uh, kind of thing here. This maybe not the most uh, beautiful artistic rendition of uh, my set, but anyway, I mean, we have, yeah, we have these kind of um, star shaped sets for level sets where sort of fix, fix A, yeah? And maybe this here is sort of the constant, constant one vector. And in fact, we have sort of a nice ball here that sort of goes through, yeah? We have this kind of cylinder set here going through there, yeah? So, so this, this is kind of what now the structure looks like of our, um, of our uh, supposed cell. And I mean, I've already drawn it as though it's a cell, yeah? Okay, and uh, the third observation is, of course, this is open. Um, and that's just uh, because it's intersection of finitely many open sets. Namely the ones, yeah, um, given by just saying that the altitude condition is uh, positive at each edge. Okay, and so so now we have sort of these three things, and um, so in our preprint um, we do something slightly shady. Um, so this is why we need to correct some details there. So we got two nice referee reports on our paper, and one said. Um, beautifully written, but there might be a flaw. And the other one said, it might be correct, but um, it could be written better. And um, in the end, I sort of agreed with both referees. There was a slight flaw in the argument and could be written better. Um, but anyway, so here, here's then, you can basically do some, um, uh, you, you can actually use some, just very basic analysis to show that um, this actually implies that this set here, is diffeomorphic with um, r to the t times r to the 2e. 
So it wasn't, I mean, the open sets, actually star-shaped open sets, star-shaped open sets in R to the N are diffeomorphic to R to the N. So I wasn't uh, aware of this fact or proof of this fact um, before, but there's actually sort of a nice discussion you can find on math overflow where uh, you're also presented with two proofs. Yeah, so the, um, maybe the one thing just, just to have in mind uh, what the, kind of difficulty is, is right? I mean, if I have sort of such a star-shaped open set, maybe it actually looks a bit like, um, let, let's even just draw something like this here, right? Here's your star-shaped open sets. And of course, also one, some of my cells, let's even uh, make this a bit better, right? I and mean, some of my um, areas also, I mean, they sort of go off to infinity somewhere, yeah? So, so here's basically a set, a star-shaped open set. And so when you look at this kind of distance function, basically to the boundary, yeah, um, then this of course has some discontinuities here. Yeah, so, so this may be the issue that you want to deal with, uh, but actually you can sort of, in some sense, you can smooth this out here. Yeah? You can sort of, uh, one way of thinking about what's happening is you sort of exhaust here, yeah? you exhaust by sort of uh, sets with, uh, with smooth boundary here, yeah. So that's one way of seeing how this, um, how this uh, diffeomorphism to Rn, yeah, might might work. Okay. So anyway, so so this is the um, this is one thing here. Uh, are there any questions or comments? No. Okay. So then let me just sort of sketch um, the second case. So the case where a delta is more general. Um, cell decomposition. Okay, so in this case here, uh, I mean, what what is going on here is you might have some right, some higher dimensional cells. Of course, you might also have lots of triangles. Who knows what you have here? And um, the first observation is again because the edge flips, edge flips sort of give you really nice um, diffeomorphisms between the parameter spaces for uh, parameterizations for different triangulations. So you can actually choose whichever um, decomposition you want. So here you could just choose if you wanted to, and that's what I really want. Yeah, you can choose sort of a decomposition where each, each of your um, higher dimensional cells, the way you turn it into a triangulation is by always just doing this kind of pulling a coning from one vertex, yeah. So, so this this just gives you very nice control over the um, over the altitude equations, yeah. And so, in particular, I mean, you get sort of these coordinates here that are close uh, to the vertex you pulled from, and then you get these other coordinates that are uh, away from the guy you pulled from. And once you've done everything in this way, you basically solve the altitude condition for the edge in terms of the one that's further away. So I will always call this here kind of the A minus, this here the A plus, yeah? And so you solve altitude at the edge A um, equal to zero for A minus, yeah? And this gives you A minus in terms of all of the A pluses and uh, the remaining uh, coordinates, which are called B. Yeah, so, so these are all called B something, B I, B J, and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's one thing you can do. And so, so this gives you a sort of a map then from, so you have R to the um, T times R to the uh, 2E, minus 2k times r to the uh, k, yeah? So this here are triangle coordinates. These here are really the edges of your cell decomposition. And these here are uh, of, um, you take this triangulation, so, Define two triangulation delta prime. 
uh, uh, delta prime minus delta, but only basically, if you think of oriented edges, it's only half of them. Yeah, so, so here you just take the uh, A plus coordinates. And here, these are the B coordinates. And then the other ones are your uh, triangle coordinates. Okay, and so this gives you a map from here to um, C delta. And uh, this map here is actually a, a diffeomorphism just because this one is a projection map. And this one here just basically solves these guys, yeah, uh, in terms of the other ones. And yeah, the, by, by just rational functions. Okay, and so now um, the, the strategy now basically using, using this kind of structure uh, is kind of similar, uh, but slightly different because here now the, uh, just to draw sort of this uh, Mickey Mouse picture. And if you think of, again, the all one vector, so where sort of B and A plus is the all one vector and the all one vector. So this actually lies now on the boundary of these guys. So you can actually show that your things are sort of uh, star shaped from uh, a point on the boundary like so, yeah. Um, but now what you can do is you can actually find um, some nice convex polyhedra, open convex polyhedra inside here, where you can show that these convex polyhedra, so these convex polyhedra here, I mean, you get a homeomorphism to the whole thing. And in fact, you get diffeomorphism to the whole thing. And then these ones here, uh, again, uh, you can use the sort of same argument as before by finding actually sort of nice sets inside here from which you can sort of make those star shaped. Okay, so, so these are these kind of sets with respect to which these polyhedra are then star shaped. So it's sort of a two, two step process. Um, and again, you're using this, this basic, very nice basic fact that an open um, star-shaped subset of R to the N is actually um, diffeomorphic to R to the N. Okay, so, so this is kind of a sketch of the um, proof of how you can use these coordinates to show um, that you actually get a um, cell decomposition um, of the whole space. Okay, so uh, let's see. So maybe then uh, some other things to just highlight because these coordinates are just really nice for uh, experimentation and playing around. So you can basically, you can define, so using the coordinates. So you can define uh, centers of cells And um, these are really related to uh, Penner centers. And so in fact, then um, the, um, the centers of the top dimensional cells are all arithmetic groups. But then if you sort of go lower down uh, to, the, to the other strata, what you see is actually, you see uh, semi-arithmetic um, uh, groups appearing. So, and, uh, sort of so it's sort of nice to try to study or understand uh, what kind of properties uh, they have. So maybe a question is sort of properties of uh, of these sort of low lower dimensional yeah so so um, should say here top dimensional implies arithmetic. Uh, and then lower dimensional is similar arithmetic. And also um, then you can ask other questions like, I mean, when you when you have sort of a structure and you have its um, 
canonical um, or you have some you have some triangulation of some structure, you can ask sort of can you actually predict how many flips you need in order to get to the uh, canon canonical cell decomposition? Yeah, so you can ask these kind of uh, algorithmic questions using using the coordinates. The question would be sort of what what's a nice sort of metric maybe on the space? Yeah, of course, Teichmuller space has different metrics, um, and so what a sort of generalizations of these metrics to this larger larger dimensional space of the yeah, moduli space of all um, real projector structures. Yeah, so um, another question. So um, metrics on um, the space. Uh, what did I call it? F or three? This G. N. Then there's sort of constructions by uh, Benoit Hüller, uh, sort of uh, generalizing what Labrie and Lofton did for closed surfaces, where they say, well, actually, a real projective structure, so real projective, is the same as a hyperbolic structure uh, plus uh, a cubic holomorphic differential, yeah? And so, um, but the the way you go from a real projective structure to the associated hyperbolic structure is actually quite mysterious, yeah? And it's not, not ex there, there's no sort of explicit way of, uh, of doing this. And so the question would really be, can, can you find sort of, can you find this relationship, say, in these A coordinates? Yeah. So is there some way of going from a real projective structure to a uh, hyperbolic structure? So, so this is sort of the question here. Can you, can you make this algorithmic? Yeah. And this would uh, maybe be also of interest to, to other applications, yeah, where you sort of use uh, hyperbolic structures as representatives of, uh, say, conformal structures or other things. So anyway, I um, could keep going on, but uh, I think my time is coming to a close, and so we'll end here. Thank you, uh, Stefan, for this uh, interesting and uh, interesting talk, both in terms of the presentation of the uh, system, but in terms of what we can, can we learn with these coordinates that we add to uh, a triangulation? What, I mean, the questions from the, your last slide. Are there any questions for Stefan? Either we're getting to the end of the day for us, for you it's the beginning of the day and people are getting uh, tired <laughs> or I have a, a a very technical and naive question that you, you mentioned something, you gave a, a simple argument for why it was true. And I'm, I'm, it's not that I'm not convinced, it's I don't see the relation. It, 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 it was in the middle of your talk, you, when you defined the altitude of what you call out for the... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, edges, you mentioned that you want to do edge flip to get this altitude to be positive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned the fact or theorem basically yeah. that states that the process of uh, uh, edge flip is going to terminate. Yeah. yeah. And you said that this was related to the fact that we have a finite number of vertices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Am I right? Only a finite number of vertices. Sorry? Yes, that's a drawing that you show. So only a finite number of vertices was a very, very brief justification that this is uh, true. M my question is, every time you flip, you change your coordinates because you have to define the coordinates for your new edge. What happened with the triangles coordinate? 
uh, the, I mean, everything, everything changes, right? I mean, you can think of this in terms of, if you, if you wish, I mean, think of it in the concrete setting, right? So here you really have vectors and co-vectors, yeah? Yeah, so here you have vectors and co-vectors. Yes. And so when you do the flip, and this triangle coordinate was the determinant of these of three the, the vectors. Co but now it becomes the determinant of the new three. Yeah, exactly. So the triangle here, exactly. This becomes sort of the determinant of these three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but my, my question was more, as you keep updating yeah. the, the uh, weights or the coordinates that you have on your triangles, mm -hmm. wh what happens is when you do a flip, you have to, in some sense, introduce the edges that you have on the side of your two triangle in your list of possible edges that you may need to flip. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so what happens here, so, so it's good to think, whoops, it's good to, sorry, it's good to think about this picture here, what happens really with this developing map, right? I mean, imagine you had some edge here, yeah, mm -hmm. and now you flip it, okay? So now this edge is basically, it's buried above, you will never see it again. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so this edge, once you sort of flip an edge, you will actually, you will never see it again. Uh -huh. Okay. And, yeah. And, and what you can do is, I mean, of course, there is sort of, yeah, if you, if you wish even, think of the cutoff so high that a fundamental domain is sitting here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if a fundamental domain is sitting here, well, there's only finitely many vertices. So there's actually not only finitely many edges between any sort of combination of these. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, of these uh, vertices, yeah. Okay, the, 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 now I understand better the picture. Mm -hmm. Aaron has raised his hand. Yeah. Yeah, um, thanks Stefan for the talk. Um, I guess I, I had a question about sort of how much of this ne like necessarily is the fact that we're sort of in the you know SL3 setting. Um, so, I mean, I know you have appealed to Cooper and Long a, a couple of times in this, um, mm -hmm. but like how much of this do you think is possibly, you know, generalizable to, you know, other SLNR decorated character varieties? Yeah, so the, uh, th that's a really interesting question because also, I mean, it's something that uh, is also actually of importance to, say, people doing three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. So here, I mean, what, what works here is, I mean, the nice thing uh, with this algorithm is it really, in the end, it terminates and you get this kind of canonical triangulation, yeah? So now in three dimensions, you sort of have the issue that, um, so so let's just look at sort of some points of flipping, right? Um, you might actually want to do a flip, but on a constellation that is like this here, yeah? So imagine you have sort of two, I, I'm going one dimension up, right? So, so I'm now thinking about three dimensional spaces Imagine now that you're really supposed to sort of do a flip here, but if you introduce this edge here, then you would actually get tetrahedra that are negatively oriented. Yeah, so I mean, ideally, right? I mean, ideally a flip would just say, well, you only do it when you're sort of here in a setting where everything is nice and convex, yeah? And then you've really replaced sort of, yeah, you've replaced two tetrahedra meeting in a phase by three tetrahedra going around an edge, yeah? But, so one of the issues is, it could be that a flip actually gives you something like this here, that's quite illegal, yeah? Because you get negatively oriented tetrahedra after this, okay? Um, Jeff Weeks actually in sort of a paper where he first sort of outlines how he um, computes canonical cell decompositions, he also gives examples where something even worse happens where you might not even have a flip that sort of gives you something um, that's negatively oriented, but you keep flipping positively oriented things, but in the end, you sort of created some kind of gap. Yeah, so, so your image, the, the total image of the developing map is not convex anymore. Yeah, so, so this is not the only obstacle. So what he does is, uh, in order to compute canonical cell decompositions, if it doesn't work for a given triangulation, he randomizes the triangulation and tries again. And it, it seems to work. So yeah, he, he after finite many randomizations, he always finds somehow a canonical triangulation. But so that's that's sort of a big open problem in higher dimensions is, is there actually an algorithm? Yeah, 
can you algorithmically determine um, the canonical cell decomposition? Starting with, yeah, some kind of input triangulation and having sort of a finite, finite decision process. Mm -hmm. I guess I was, so that, that was very interesting. I guess I was asking a little bit more about actually, yeah. right, so Fokker Gantrov give these A coordinates for like any, I guess, mm -hmm. LNR character variety for a punctured yeah. surface. Um, and I guess it, it was more about like sort of generalizing that direction of it, not necessarily oh, oh, sorry. Um, from triangulation to tetrahedra. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, you, you were thinking about um, the story where you go from this setting to this setting here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You go from coordinates to uh, this year. Yeah, and I think that that would be an interesting thing to uh, look into. So I haven't, I haven't done this, um, but I think that would be really worthwhile doing. Are there any other questions for Stefan? If not, I think we should uh, thank Stefan again for this uh, very interesting talk. And uh, we, let's just take a uh, sort of five minute break before we move to the uh, last talk of uh, today's uh, uh, of, for today. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.